All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm Dr. Laura Crotty Alexander. I'm here at the University of California, San Diego, and it's my pleasure to host uh, today, mainly to moderate our ATS COVID-19 Critical Care Training Forum. Um, today's topic is care of critically ill COVID-19 patients, uh, best practices from Europe, Israel, and India. We are very excited to have three discussants here today. Uh, Dr. Chaco, professor of uh, the Medical Intensive Care Unit at Christian Medical College and Hospital in India. Welcome, Dr. Chaco. We also have Dr. Uh, Karagianidis, who is the chair of the European Respiratory Society Group uh, in Acute Critical Care, and he's calling in uh, from Germany. Thank you for joining us. And finally, we have Dr. Ahn, who's head of the Institute of Pulmonary Physiology and Exercise at the Shiva Medical Center in Israel. So welcome, Dr. Ahn. Hi. And just wanted to remind everybody that we have been running these uh, COVID critical care training forum sessions for a year now, and we have them all recorded and shared freely on the ATS website. So if you type in ATS COVID forum, uh, it will pop up uh, very quickly. And there's lots of different things to, um, oops, sorry, apologies there. Uh, lots of different topics that we've covered over time. This wouldn't have been possible without my co-chairs, including Dr. Naraf Shah, Dr. Sushma Kribs, and Dr. Viren Call. Most importantly, uh, Dr. Isabel Pedraza from Cedar sinai organized this session today and did a lot of work. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pedraza. We also have had a team of trainees who's contributed to these sessions over time. And of course, the amazing ATS staff, uh, including Lauren Lynch, Liz Guzman, uh, and Eileen Larson, without whom this would not be possible. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and I'm going to welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Kara Gianitis um, to jump in and share with us uh, experiences uh, from his locale. Uh, and any questions that anybody has, please pop them into the chat box. We will have time for questions and answers as we go. Yes, uh, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me. And um, I would like to give you some insights um, how we managed uh, now the third wave here in Germany and uh, give you an overview about the structure we have here and about some data we obtained during the first and second wave of the pandemic. And in the end, if you're interested, I will show you some unpublished new data about the utilization of non-invasive ventilation outcome and so on. So first of all, these are my conflicts. So, and this is an overview about, um, about the intensive care units in Europe. And um, that is, um, I guess, especially very interesting to hear Israel afterwards. And um, this is an overview how many ICU beds we have in, in Germany compared to other European countries. And uh, these colleagues here from Germany, they calculated a regional accessible index. That means how many intensive care beds you have per 1,000 inhabitants. And you see that we have in Germany around about 30 per 100,000. And on the other side, you have uh, countries such as uh, Portugal on the very low end. You have sometimes less than 10 ICU beds per 1,000 inhabitants. And that is something which is very important, especially if we talk about a European perspective, which means that we not only think in the borders of our countries, but in managing such a pandemic across Europe. Um, in the beginning, when the first wave came to Germany, we had many informations from Northern Italy. And maybe you also heard in the beginning that there was a huge surge in uh, the Lombardia region that is in the northern part of Italy, and they had not enough ICU beds to, to give it to every patient who really needed that. And this information came very early to Germany, and uh, we were very anxious that we, that we don't have enough ICU beds. And that was the reason why we developed the nationwide ICU registry. And that was done by our 
Intensive Care Society in Germany in conjunction with our CDC and with the German healthcare minister. And afterwards, and uh, we, we, we built this ICU registry within a few uh, weeks, we knew that we have around about 1,000 hospitals in Germany. And of these 1,500 hospitals, around about 1,300 have an ICU. And afterwards, we knew that we have around about 20 to 30,000 ICU beds. I'll show you in a moment the details of uh, what we had. And um, with this, um, with the CDC in our bag, and together with the German Ministry of Health, we were able to, to ask every hospital in Germany to give us some information. That means not only how many ICU beds you have, but this also means how many COVID patients do you have and do you have capacities for the uh, patients? Because this was our, our greatest fear in the beginning. And therefore we introduced such a, uh, such a system that if you have no capacities on your ICU in your hospital, you are in red. If you have maybe a few capacities, you are yellow. And if you have enough free capacities, you are green. So this was very important because if you have such a nationwide registry, which is accessible for everyone, and the press in Germany used that now very much, you always see in which city, in which part of your city are some ICU beds for your COVID patients. And this helped us very much in the beginning to get an impression how many beds we have and if we can handle the patients. And I guess that was in the first and also in the second wave, that was a really a clue in Germany to, um, to, manage, uh, to manage this wave and to be always sure that we can give an ICU bed to everyone who really needs it. And uh, usually you know that ICU beds have not a specific definition internationally and so we 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 went to to a specific definition in germany and we divided uh, the quality of the icu beds into high care and low care and low care means that you can do everything for example non-invasive ventilation that you can do high flow oxygen therapy but you cannot intubate a patient or handle a patient with intubation that is a big difference to a high care bed and then you know that we have many hospitals in Germany and we now know that these are 183 who offer ECMO therapy in more than 200 ICUs. And this is a third category we introduced. And this is how it looks like. Um, this uh, German words here means that's a trend over time. And uh, this uh, orange line are the COVID-19 cases on the ICU. And below you see the free high care capacities. And this is something everyone uses in Germany. And you see that, you, that we have in, in peak in the first wave around about 3000 COVID patients. Then we had a quite nice summer. And then with the, with the second wave beginning in September, October, we had a very strong peak which lasted uh, until the beginning of January with a maximum of 6,000 COVID patients. And most of them were on invasive or non-invasive mechanical ventilation. And then everyone in the news looks every day into this registry and sees that we went down, so it worked well. And then we reached this bottom line and that was uh, the case uh, when B117 arrived in Germany. And we had once more an increase in the infection numbers and you know that we are facing now the third wave because our vaccination speed is not that fast like you have in the US or like in the UK. And this is, uh, this is always, uh, that was due to the, to the uh, B117 variant, which is now 90% of all cases in Germany. On the other hand, you see that we have always some free high care capacities. And these 2000 beds now for 83 million people in Germany is the lowest number we had. But compared to other European countries, it's still quite a lot. So I'm convinced that we can manage also the third wave. Also, we are all very, very tired. 
So this is the second point you see. And uh, as I, I told you before, if you are green, you have enough capacities and you see that on a regional level now here in this uh, left-hand side, I put that together for the whole country. And you see that we had always until the summer enough capacity and then it really dropped down. And now you see with the third wave, we have the highest number now, nearly 500 ICUs have no longer any capacities for treating this COVID-19 patients. The greens are now around about 300 and they will drop, I guess, within the next two or three weeks once more. So the, the ICUs, especially in the, in the centers, are really occupied. On the right-hand side, you see that we have now the lowest capacity for ECMO patients, and these are only now left around about 170 beds for ECMO across Germany, which is the lowest number we ever recognized in Germany. And you see that B117 is really um, making the patients even more sick than we had in the first and in the second wave. And this is something which is visible to everyone in Germany. So we have that as an open access approach and everyone now knows <coughs> how many free beds we have. And this gives you something like, uh, yeah, you, you are more secure that you know that you have enough beds. But on the other hand, we are always confronted with, oh, you have enough beds. We don't need a lockdown. And, you know, all these discussions, I guess you had it also in your country. So we analyzed then some of these patients, and um, this uh, was our first analysis of the uh, of the first wave. There were around about ten thousand patients, which were admitted to the German hospitals. And as um, as you see, from one thousand five hundred hospitals with ICUs, only five hundred and sixty really treated these patients. That is a center effect in Germany. I guess you all know that uh, the gender is nearly equal if you look at all patients, but on the ICU there was a clear over-representation of males in a factor two to one. And uh, we had also this typical, typical comorbidities, except obesity. This was, I guess, more in the US than co compared to Germany. Now in the second wave and the third wave, we had also more obese patients in Germany, but not uh, as much as uh, in the US. But otherwise, we have the same comorbidities like you would expect. It. So let me show what happened. And I told you in the beginning that the Lombardia region was really under search. And you see that uh, in this uh, publication of the first 1,600 patients from the Northern Italy ICUs, you see, if you look at the age distribution, the huge problem <coughs> the colleagues had in Italy, because there was a clear cut with, uh, in the age of 75, and all patients older than 75 don't have really an access to the ICUs in Northern Italy. And this was something which was, <clears throat> yeah, I would say, devastating, and this was very impressive for us. If you compare that to our data, most of the patients in the first wave were even older than 75 years. And that is something which really shows you the dramatic situation we had in Europe. In some parts of Italy, not enough ICU capacities. In Germany, clearly enough ICU capacities. And then we had, during this first wave, we had a transfer of some of the patients from Italy, from Belgium and from Netherlands to Germany because we had enough capacities. But nevertheless, uh, this, sh this shows you how dramatic this was uh, during the first wave. What is uh, one of the, of the biggest problems we have with these patients, even if you have enough capacity? This disease makes you really sick. And uh, this is a mortality of patients with um, mechanical ventilation. And you see that we had in the first wave a mortality of nearly 53%. And even on the ward, we had a mortality of 16%. So despite having enough capacities, the mortality was really high. What was uh, one of the major problems? If you look at the age distribution, and that is something we can really learn, <clears throat> not only from the first wave, but I guess also from the from the uh, from the second wave and now also in the third wave, the mortality is very high in patients in the age of over 80. The mortality is lower in patients of age below 60. So, but it also reached nearly 30 percent. 
And you see that the mortality on the ward without mechanical ventilation, without being transferred to the ICU, was uh, still uh, 34%. So this is something, so you really see that this disease, and I guess you all know that, is really age-related and, uh, and older patients, I guess you have really to discuss if they go to the ICU or not. Afterwards, we analyzed the second wave. And the second wave uh, began in Germany in September, October. And if you look at the data, only look at the, at the last, uh, at the bottom line, the in-hospital mortality was in the second wave even a little bit higher than in the first wave, although we introduced steroids, although we were familiar now with dealing with the patients, but it's still a very high mortality in patients with mechanical ventilation. And one of the reasons was, if you compare the number of patients with invasive mechanical ventilation and non-invasive mechanical ventilation, that we had a huge shift from invasive to non-invasive mechanical ventilation in the second wave. And if you look at the, at the data, patients with, uh, with uh, NIV failure, which we defined as being intubated, was much higher in the second wave compared to the first wave. If you look here, non-invasive ventilation failure after day five occurred in 30% of the patients compared to only 17% during the first wave. And now if you look at the mortality rates, and if you put that together, you see that you have still a mortality rate putting the whole year together of around about 50% in patients with mechanical ventilation around about 30% if NIV works, but this works only in 50% of the patients. And if you have an NIV failure, the mortality is pretty high. And if you look at, the, at, the, at figure B, you see that the mortality is strictly related also to the day of NIV failure. And, um, and the mortality rate of let's say 70% or even more than that, which is sometimes comparable to, to cancer patients, is such high that we really have to think about how invasive, how, how far shall we go with non-invasive ventilation? And I guess we have to think on this concept of patient self-inflicted lung injury and how early do we have really to intubate the patients if we have enough capacities for that? That was one of the, the biggest points, I guess, we learned during the last weeks. So now we analyze, and I'm coming to the end, the first six months follow-up data. These are around about 9,000 patients. And uh, you see on the left-hand side, and this was a little bit astonishing for me, the most profound factor and the best you can do in COVID is being a woman because the, um, the uh, mortality rate is uh, substantial lower in uh, women, not only in the beginning, but also lasting for the first six months. You also see on the right hand side that the mortality is highest in patients in the age over 80 years. But we also had some findings like congestive heart failure, that is really clear, but also patients with neurological disorders during the first hospital stay, and we had quite a number of hospital readmissions after release from the hospital, it was around about 25% within the uh, first six months, you see that, the, that they have really a substantial impact on long-term mortality of these patients. The second point I would like to stress is that coagulopathy, and that means thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, was really a profound factor in mortality. And let me say that uh, in patients who were uh, released alive from the hospital, 16% of them died within uh, the, the following six months. And that was the highest number we observed for any of the diseases uh, we looked at. And this is my last slide, and this is something I would like to stress once more. This is the YOTS ratio for, uh, for long-term mortality in these patients, and you see that being a female is, uh, is really the most protective factor. The YOTS ratio is very low with 0.6, and the confidence interval that's very important if you look at the odds ratio, that also the confidence interval is very low in this case. And the second point I would like to stress, because this is important for, for your daily clinical practice, is 
that patients with coagulopathy have such a high risk, which is almost comparable to liver disease. And you know that liver disease have uh, quite a high mortality. And this is something I guess we can do in the future that if a patient survives COVID-19, if he's released from the hospital, I guess it's very important that we look at the patients, especially on those one who had thrombosis, pulmonary embolescence, and so on during their initial admission. Okay, thank you for your attention, and uh, I would be happy to take uh, questions from you. Thank you so much. That was so informative, uh, and I'm glad to report that Dr. Pedraza has uh, joined us. She had to cut out of ICU rounds, so she's going to be taking over as moderator. But Dr. Kara Gianitis, that was really fascinating. Uh, thank you for sharing all of um, these different patterns that you've seen in Germany, and it's kind of uh, I thought one question for you is what do you think of the UK data that, you know, su they suggest that the B117 variant is causing less severe disease, but your data is more uh, consistent with the, the publication prior. Oh. So, so I would say also for my daily clinical practice that B117 makes them even more sick. So we have the low CT values in the PCR in these patients. Sometimes we see 15, 16. We see very high LDH level. And um, this is, I guess, something which is a, a marker for, for the lung inflammation, much higher than in the beginning. We have many young patients without any comorbidities. So that is new, really, in the third wave now in Germany. And my impression is that it makes more sick. If the mortality is higher, I'm not really sure because the patients are getting younger now in Germany. So, and, and age has such a strong influence. But I'm convinced and I agree with this first uh, publication from BMJ that it uh, makes more sick. All right. And it was reassuring to see that the comorbidities are very similar in Germany. Um, but I particularly was fascinated by the uh, highlighting of those three conditions that really predict poor mortality. So the coagulopathy that you mentioned. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, um, I have one additional uh, question. Um, and just because I observed this in my own institution, why do you think there was such a switch to non-invasive ventilation as a, a, a first modality? Yeah. Why do you think we see that or appears to have a higher mortality when they fail on invasive ventilation. Yeah. That is, uh, that is one of the darkest sides of this pandemic in Germany. And um, there was a huge, uh, there were one or two doctors in Germany who put a huge pressure on the German press to promote that non-invasive ventilation is the best you can do. That was in every newspaper, that was in the television and so on. <clears throat> and many colleagues in Germany adapted that. And uh, we as a referral center received in the second wave after seven, nine or 10 days, we received a call. The patient has 100% uh, oxygen since five days. So the CO2 is increasing, nothing is working. And uh, can you put them on ECMO? And that, is, um, that was something which, which, yeah, which was really a huge, huge problem during the second wave. That, were, that there was clearly an overuse of NIV. So in the, in the beginning, we had an underuse because we were always afraid to be infected and so on by non-invasive ventilation or by high flow oxygen. And then we had really the turnaround to, to an overuse of NIV. And I'm, I guess you know this uh, concept from Laurent Bouchard and uh, Antonio Pesenti of this patient self-inflicted lung injury. And that is something which is, I guess, very important. You have to look at the patient, how's the breathing frequency, how's the depth of the breath, and how does the patient behave. So we do also prone positioning with non-invasive ventilation. And if they are under control, it's okay. But if they have still a very high respiratory drive, I guess they are really running into this vicious circle and they at the end this this lung is something like we observe sometimes lung fibrosis yeah that is uh, that is comparable to that and that's the reason why the mortality rate is such high yeah I, I, I agree I think that there there's more to learn in terms of uh, the self-induced lung injury in these patients and maybe being able to identify who's a good candidate and who's yeah. not um, okay, well, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I want to move now over to Dr. Vanilla Chaco. Uh, Dr. Chaco, do you have your slides? Yes, uh, I'll just share my screen. Here? 
Okay, I think you need to stop sharing, uh, Dr. Kianaji. Thanks. Okay, um, this is Dr. Benilla Chaco. Um, she is joining us from the uh, Christian Medical College and Hospital in India. Uh, welcome, Dr. Chaco. Thank you so much. Um, uh, this good day to all the participants on this forum. And I bring you greetings from Christian Medical College, Velour. I'd like to thank all the organizers for inviting me to share our experience with all of you. So I have a disclaimer to make. Um, while this presentation is internally valid in terms of uh, the fact that all the departments in CMC Velour had similar protocols during the COVID pandemic, external validity to the rest of India is problematic because I'm sure all of you know that India is a heterogeneous country in terms of education, economy, and access to healthcare. So the objectives of the session is to take you through uh, the challenges in the management of patients that we faced, uh, discuss the strategies that we evolved to tackle the pandemic, and the prognosis and outcomes of the critically ill COVID-19 patients who were admitted uh, to our hospital. So how is um, India different from the rest of the world? I was very um, amazed to see the numbers presented by the previous speaker. Uh, the impact of COVID pandemic has uh, affected you know, several countries, but India has been hit really hard and is facing major challenges due to various reasons. And you can see here that we have the highest population in the world, and it's also a fairly dense population. If you look at the number of ICU beds, this is way, way lower uh, than several countries or maybe most countries across the world, uh, given our, our huge number of uh, our, our population. So in the whole country, in India, the whole of India, there's only nine, there are only 95,000 ICU beds. And uh, it's not just the low number of ICU beds, but also the inequity of access to ICU beds due to triage or payment issues, which is a source of concern. And you can see here that most of the ICU beds and ventilators are concentrated in seven states across the country. And um, there is also a low staff patient ratio. There are only 12,000 trained intensivists for the whole country. And the number of trained nurses are also much less. In, in most ICUs across India, there's only one to two nursing. That is, that is one nurse for two patients, irrespective of uh, organ failure. So uh, the number of ventilators for the whole country is 48,000. That is only 50% of ICU beds have access to ventilators. And so you can see that critical care provision in IC in India is challenging, not just in the non-pandemic times, but the pandemic times have exaggerated the endemic shortages in staffing and infrastructure. And um, so given that we anticipate more than 100,000 COVID ICU admissions in India, this limited critical care facility has put enormous pressure on existing ICU services. A little bit of background into CMC Velour. This was founded by uh, a third generation American missionary doctor, uh, Dr. Ida Skada in 1900. CMC uh, is a large teaching hospital uh, with over 2000 beds. And this is our statistics on a daily basis, a huge uh, workflow and large number of patients uh, who visit our hospital. We have 110 adult ICU beds, 40 pediatric ICU beds with over 10,000 ICU admissions every year. Now, the challenges that we faced in India were several during the pandemic, but um, many are common to the rest of the world. But there are four unique domains where as a country we were more impacted. Uh, first of all, limitations in ICU resources, limited space and limited equipment. Secondly, we had a shortage of skilled ICU personnel. Third, there was a problem with getting access to adequate personal protective equipment. And fourth, um, as several societies across the world have recommended negative pressure rooms, most ICUs in India do not have access to proper negative pressure rooms. So what strategy did we approach as an institution? So we had the 5R approach. And there was a clear need uh, for us to, you know, to uh, scale up our services and we responded to it systematically and in an organized manner. We repurposed um, skilled personnel to work in ICU. And uh, 
because of the absence of negative pressure rooms, re-engineering solutions were uh, worked on to make our ICUs as safe as possible for the healthcare workers, reconceptualize communication, and we redefined the role of NIV in COVID respiratory failure. The first COVID patient in India came in the last week of uh, January, and we had four months to prepare, during which a lot of protocols were get gotten ready and were updated constantly. Several committees were created in CMC Valor to deal with the challenges that I mentioned earlier. Right through, the administrative team was um, getting weekly updates and is still getting weekly updates from biostatistician on the projections for the district and the state. And these projections have been fairly accurate and help support the authorities in planning of resources, personnel, ICU and hospital bed capacity, and in getting prepared for the peak which hit us in September of last year. And with this mathematical modeling, we actually realized that we needed to create a surge ICU area. So in record time of two weeks, this area, which you see here, used to be an examination hall in India. This was converted to an ICU area, and we were able to get sufficient equipment thanks to the support of our donors and benefactors. As the pandemic raged, raged on last year, there were concerns that we could have a shortage in oxygen. And so oxygen concentrators were set up. Smaller hospitals actually resorted to getting individual oxygen concentrators due to limitations and the time lag in getting oxygen in the hospitals. Now, the surge area, which I mentioned earlier, obviously didn't suffice. Uh, the numbers shot up and other ICU areas which were uh, uh, you know, catering to non-COVID services were utilized for COVID care. And this put tremendous pressure on non-COVID critical care. And uh, this increase in numbers was anticipated as we saw the situation across the world. And we set up triage criteria, which are unique to our culture. So you can see here, our cutoff of age was about less than 60 years uh, because of our sheer numbers. And uh, at these uh, triaging was done by mm -hmm. the accident and emergency department, where it was ascertained if there were any potentially unsalvageable factors that precluded ICU admission and a priority list was made based on salvageability. The directives from the government were changing frequently and the healthcare workers needed to be aware of these protocols. So clinical protocols and otherwise were set up by the hospital infection control committee and clinical management teams. And this helped all of us keep in touch with uh, the tremendous amount of research and the different protocols that were coming out from different areas in the world. And all this was accessible uh, to the staff on the hospital internet. Initially, with the lockdown, as I mentioned earlier, access to PPE was difficult. And here you can see in February of last year, that's before the pandemic hit us, uh, our ICU registrars and some of the other staff were making in-house visors, which you can see were made out of transparency sheets fitted onto surgical caps. And we used this for about a month. But we've come a long way from our modified PPE that you can see here. Um, we actually look like little blue penguins roaming around the ICU to hazmat suits, uh, thanks to the our donors and the coordinated efforts of the masks and supplies committee in our hospital. As the surge happened, it was realized that different teams in different areas didn't help and we needed to have a central COVID command center and uh, several activities were coordinated in this COVID command center, such as contact tracing, admission pathways, bed management, and HR planning as well. Burnout was anticipated. And uh, so there was a lot of psychological and mental support provided to staff. And through several options set, that included staff support groups, Lean On Me, which was an online uh, support system for the staff. And uh, there, were, there was also resources available from the psychiatrist, psychologist, and pastoral care. Moving on to the next aspect, we had a shortage of skilled healthcare workers. And during the peak of the pandemic, you can see here that close to almost 1,000 beds, which is half our bed strength in CMC, was allotted to COVID care, and 110 ICU beds were taking care of COVID patients. 
Uh, we have about 10,000 uh, healthcare workers in the institution and 2,000, that is almost a fifth of them, were uh, deployed to work in COVID areas at different levels based on their skill set. We are very grateful that uh, there were, even though some staff did get COVID, there was no staff mortality in the institution. Now, these uh, healthcare workers needed to be upskilled. So there were a lot of training modules which were put in place. We are a large institution. And so most of the training happened through online uh, videos and small group training programs. And CMC Velour uh, also conducted several online lectures which catered to both large and small mission hospitals across the country. And this was much appreciated. Our hospital does not have negative pressure rooms. And so we had to work on re-engineering solutions to make sure our ICU was as safe and reduce the viral load uh, and the exposure to our healthcare workers. And these were some innovative solutions which were put in place. The ICUs were provided with additional exhaust airflows uh, which created uh, negative pressure and allowed for const uh, maybe at least eight to 12 air exchanges. HEPA filters were incorporated into the air handling units and they were isolated units as well. And this was standard of care anywhere across the country. And in the world, you had um, antimicrobial filters fitted onto the expiratory limbs. There was a shortage of ventilators globally. It was difficult for us to get access to ventilators. So this uh, was something which was done and is still being used in the wards. Uh, parts of condemned ventilators were scavenged uh, to create CPAP machines. And these were used, uh, being used in the ward uh, during the peak of the pandemic. We had to look at new ways of communicating with patients. Um, you know, India is one is a place where there's a lot of family support. And so new ways of communicating with these large families uh, had to be looked into. And uh, uh, phone calls, WhatsApp video calls were the modes of communication with families. This is indeed challenging. This was an interesting write-up, uh, the phone of life and death, thoughts from a frontline caregiver by one of our ICU registrars who discussed the various challenges she faced just by this mode of communication. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we had to... Uh, scale up our ICU activity, close to over 100 beds, taking care of ICU patients. We had limited ICU faculty taking care of these patients. And uh, there was a time when one faculty had to take care of close to 50 patients. And this Google spreadsheet handover really helped us and helped alert the intensivists to the very sick patients who were the orange and the red zones. Management was not different to the rest of the world. Uh, we uh, Based on the evidence that came up, dexamethasone was used for all COVID respiratory failure who were on oxygen. Remdesivir was considered early on patients who were in low flow oxygen. Anticoagulation also was given. We were part of a multicentric uh, placid trial on convalescent plasma and tocilizumab and plasma exchange has been used for a few patients only in CMC. Hydroxychloroquine was not used in our setting. Now, as I mentioned earlier, and as the previous speaker mentioned, we were concerned about using an IV. In fact, when the medical superintendent asked us at the start of the pandemic last year, uh, how are you going to be managing your patients? We said, we don't have negative pressure rooms. We're definitely going to be putting patients in invasive ventilation and close suctioning. And IV is not an option for us. Um, but, you know, one story actually changed the way we looked at NIV. Um, our results from invasive ventilation in the first two months of the pandemic was disappointing, as was seen in several centers across the world. And in this illustrative case, uh, we did see that uh, NIV worked. Uh, you can see here that this is a gentleman with moderate ARDS, a PF ratio of around 120, with a high work of breathing, respiratory rate around 60. And uh, so he was put on NIV and awake proning. And you can see as time went on, within five to seven days, his work of breathing improved. PF ratio got better, he was discharged and sent back home. And after seeing this in a few patients, this led us to formulate a protocol for COVID ventilatory management in our ICU. So uh, we realized that we had to change the thresholds uh, for intubation, as well as uh, change the thresholds for a duration for NIV support. Uh, because as the previous speaker mentioned, we did note that as the duration of NIV support increased, uh, the likelihood of failure was much higher, the likelihood of mortality was much higher. And 
all of us know that traditionally NIV was recommended for reversible respiratory conditions and not particularly for ARDS. But our experiences uh, actually made us push our boundaries despite the lack of our negative pressure rooms to try NIV, even in patients with moderate and severe ARDS for periods longer than three days and sometimes exceeding seven days with considerable success. And I'm just gonna show you preliminary data which is being sent for publication. Um, so we've managed close to 1,000 ICU patients, which contributed to 10% of our hospital admissions. Uh, this is preliminary data from the six months, first six months. And as you can see here, uh, a, a significant overwhelming majority, close to 86% of our patients were managed on NIV. And NIV was successful in two thirds of these patients. When I say successful, I mean that they were are not intubated and they were just managed in NIV alone in two thirds of the patients, irrespective of ARDS severity. Our overall mortality in this group of patients of 351 patients was 33%. Uh, and uh, there was limitations of care set put in for a subset of patients. Now, our concerns about risk to healthcare workers. We had 260 healthcare workers involved in the care of ICU COVID patients last year, and it's still ongoing. We're in our second peak now, and only 3% of ICU staff had uh, became COVID positive um, and had mild illness over the past one year. So, um, so what we've seen here is, you know, in India, one of the major challenges is there's a burden of not just COVID disease, but non-COVID disease, given the limitations in ICU beds, uh, regional distribution, and inequity of ICU access. Now, CMC has managed those thousand ICU patients and the numbers are going up right now as the second wave has hit us. But it is heartbreaking to know that there are several thousands of other patients who haven't been able to get access to healthcare in the country. And definitely the non-COVID work has suffered. So I'd just like to come back uh, to uh, how we responded to the pandemic. Um, we uh, responded to the need. Uh, we repurposed healthcare workers to work in ICUs, uh, even though we have, we have a tremendous shortage of skilled personnel. The ICUs were re-engineered to make it as safe as possible for the healthcare workers, reconceptualize communication, and redefine the role of NIP. Um, and uh, before I end, I would like to thank the administrative team of CMC Valor, who were extremely supportive and constantly interacting with all of us and all the ICU healthcare workers who seamlessly um, and selflessly gave uh, their service in a time of need and all our benefactors who helped us give uh, deliver care seamlessly to our patients. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer some questions right now. Thank you so much, Dr. Chaco. That was uh, really a very, uh, quite a presentation. Um, you certainly have taken care probably of more patients than most of us here, um, or at least that's what you've seen at your institution. Um, I was wondering in the alternative modes of, of ventilation that you were describing, um, I know that we went through the different possibilities at our institution and that uh, in areas where they employed these, they were having difficulty with really having inspissated thick and sometimes very hardened secretions. Um, I was wondering, did you, did you come across that problem? Did, did it require you, how, did you approach it with bronchoscopy? Was that something that you used uh, as a normal tool? Um, I was wondering what your experience was with these alternate modes of ventilation. I, are you talking about while they were on NIV or uh, invasive ventilation as well? Invasive ventilation, yes. Okay, uh, so yes, initially we did face problems because we were not doing active humidification and because of the risk of uh, aerosol generation. Definitely, uh, there were frequent episodes of mucus plugging. Uh, I think we became a little more confident, maybe a little bolder as time got on, you know, even since our experience with NIV and the large amount of aerosol generation which happens in our setting, uh, which led us to start using um, humidification probably after the you know, first week of uh, ICU stay, uh, they were on active humidification in the ICU. And that kind of brought down our problems of thick secretions. Definitely, we did face a problem. Uh, bronchoscopy, we did avoid. Uh, now, again, it's to do with skilled personnel, you know, like, you know, the ability to have 
skilled personnel to go in to do bronchoscopy was limited. Um, but what we have seen uh, is, uh, you know, I think the use of NIV uh, was, was much, much higher uh, than invasive ventilation. Uh, we kind of realized that it was, it um, definitely helped our group of patients. We've used it even in patients with severe ARDS, but I would agree with the previous speaker that, you know, be cautious beyond three to five days. If an IV is not working, it's unlikely to work. So don't prolong it. Don't keep on going with an IV. It's best to probably intubate your patients by about day five, delaying it beyond day seven, I don't think helps anybody. So... Um, yes, I, I agree with that. Um, there's time for one quick question from the chat box. Um, this is, uh, are you sequencing for variants and what do you think is the largest contributing factor to the current wave, which seems deadlier than the prior one? Uh, so in India, we're not, at least in the state where I'm in, uh, we are not sequencing for variants. It is a directive from the government. So uh, we are not sequencing in our state at this moment. Definitely in India, I'm sure all of you would have seen pictures. Um, it's extremely challenging to social distance uh, and um, all those are issues, you know, there's elections happening and the huge crowds. Uh, I'm sure all that uh, is definitely contributing to the huge, the wave, uh, the second wave. Our patients are definitely younger. Now we've just started on the second wave. It's probably just a couple of weeks into our second wave right now. Uh, our patient cohort is definitely younger uh, and this is even after a couple of doses of vaccination as well. Uh, so some of them have presented after vaccination um, and they are sicker. And, you know, whether it's because of the variant or whether it's because, you know, we, in the first wave, we were quite paranoid. And as you saw, we had over 10,000 patients in the hospital. Patients were admitted even if they had mild illness. And so they were escalated. Care was escalated quite rapidly, unlike now where they sit at home and they come in only when they're much sicker. So... That's the situation here. Uh, thank you for very much for that uh, presentation. Um, I want to move on now to Dr. Ahn, uh, just to make sure we have enough time for everyone. Um, Dr. Ahn, are you on? Okay, there you are. Uh, this is Amir Ahn. He's the head of the Institute of Pulmonology, Physiology, and Exercise at Sheba Medical Center in right. Israel, and he will be sharing uh, his experiences. Right, so hello everyone. Uh, it's uh, late at night here in Israel. And uh, I'm uh, not an ICU person, I'm a chest physician. On normal days, I was dealing with lung cancer, diagnosis, diagnosing and managing patients with lung cancer. But due to the uh, uh, pandemic here in Israel, I was switched to uh, work on patients with uh, COVID. So the take home message is very simple. We thank God and Pfizer for almost putting an end to the pandemic here in our country, because uh, it seems that uh, unlike other countries, and we heard the reports from Germany and India, uh, we are almost coming back to normal life here in Israel. So we are uh, a small country here in the Middle East. You see Israel is surrounded by Egypt, Jordan, uh, Syria, and Lebanon, and this is the Mediterranean. Uh, there are nine people, nine million people uh, who uh, live in our country. 75% of them are Jewish, 21% uh, uh, are Arabs. Uh, the uh, fertility rate is high in our country. And uh, uh, normally women have uh, three uh, children, putting us uh, in the highest group in the OECD. On the other hand, the healthcare expenditure, and I'll get to it in a second, is very low. It's uh, only 5, 7.5% of the uh, GDP. Amazingly, the life expectancy is relatively high, although the uh, expend expenses of the government on health are relatively low. And gi this gives us the number of ICU beds, including cardiac ICU, we have eight to uh, 100,000 uh, people, population. So the numbers are lower than the, in Europe. We heard that in Italy it's 12.5, in Germany, in the US it's almost 30. And uh, we started the uh, pandemic a year ago with almost 2,000 uh, ventilators in our country. And uh, nowadays we use ventilators and ECMOs and we have in the whole country 80, 
AT ECMOs. So this is the information on the status of the uh, COVID-19 in Israel. And uh, as you can see, uh, the report was taken uh, five hours ago from the uh, website of the Israeli Ministry of Health. The uh, percent of the positive tests nowadays in Israel, 0.4%. Total death toll, 6,309. The number of patients who got vaccinated is almost 60%. 60% of the population got the uh, first shot and uh, almost 5 million. So it's 92% of them got the second shot as well. And we're talking about the Pfizer vaccines. Nowadays in uh, our hospitals are 230 patients with, uh, who are considered to be severe cases in critical status 136 on ventilators 120. The numbers are extremely low in comparison to previous, previous month. There are in Israel nowadays uh, 33,000 patients, active patients, in hospitals, 340, 20 of them are isolated in hotels and uh, 3,000 of them are at home. The uh, total new cases, the daily toll is uh, 200 uh, cases. So the numbers are going down in our country. Let us go back a year ago and describe what happened at the beginning of 2020. The data was uh, published in uh, PLOS One uh, last uh, year. So these are the days of the first wave of COVID-19 in Israel. Uh, the first confirmed uh, case was in uh, February. This gave us a couple of months to, uh, to get uh, ready. And the numbers got uh, higher and higher very rapidly. And the reason that the numbers got higher very rapidly was that the population in Israel did not believe in the reports that they saw in the media. In the media. Uh, last March, a year ago, was uh, characterized by chaos. You can see uh, young people partying in Tel Aviv, the, the uh, capital of Israel, many demonstrations against the prime minister in Jerusalem and the ultra-Orthodox Jews who just couldn't give, uh, well, I don't want to say uh, dirty words here, here at night, but uh, they did not comply with the government recommendations on the, on the social distancing and isolation, as you can see by this uh, number of uh, black heads. Everybody continued with their normal lives and the numbers were soaring up. So this put us uh, in the hospitals in a, in a very grave situation. As I told you, we didn't have enough respirators, not enough ICU beds. And uh, in a very short period of time, we have to uh, make the underground parking areas uh, into uh, ICU uh, um, areas. Uh, we did it with the Israeli army. And here on this uh, picture, you can see me working with the uh, Israeli uh, technological unit and uh, working on the, as we heard the experience in India, we were thinking that we will not have enough ventilators. So we were switching a uh, BiPAP into a ventilator. And the idea was to uh, develop a monitoring device that would assist the uh, physician to control the patient who are on these uh, um, modified ventilators. Luckily enough, we did not have to use these uh, ventilators. We had enough ventilators, so it was not used. And the reason is that we did not uh, um, have to use this uh, BiPAP was that the Israeli Mossad, the intelligence uh, service of our country, uh, went shopping, believe it or not, uh, all over the world, and they bought uh, 3,000 ventilators. So we had at the beginning 2,000 and the end of the first wave of the COVID, we ended up by having uh, 5,000 ventilators that are now parking in the, uh, in, in the shops and nobody's using them. In this uh, graph, it's in Hebrew, but you can see that the numbers uh, of the uh, patients in Israel decreased when the uh, prime minister declared a status uh, of emergency 
and the whole country went into a shutdown. This happened several times in the uh, last year, and uh, one of the uh, major impact was on the major Jewish holidays when people are partying together. Uh, this year, everybody had to stay home and not visit his uh, grandparents. It was a very sad year. But uh, let us uh, see um, what was the impact on the uh, population in Israel as compared to other countries in Europe that have similar uh, size population, Sweden and Greece and Italy, which has a larger uh, population. So Israel, uh, almost 9 million, Sweden, 10 million, Greece, 10 million, and Italy with the 60 million. We can see that the uh, um, first uh, confirmed cases were in February in all, in, in all the countries. The first death case was in March of last year, but the mortality rate was very high in two countries, in Italy. And we think that the reason was that the uh, uh, age of the population in Northern Italy that was hit very bad was is relatively high. Elderly patients uh, live in these areas. And also in Sweden, because the uh, Swedish government uh, at the beginning uh, was in favor of uh, herd immunization. And as you can see over here, unfortunately, it, it did not work and the uh, death toll was very high in this uh, country. In Israel, we reported a uh, different number of cases according to the population. For example, in the uh, Tel Aviv area, where most of the uh, people were complying with the uh, government recommendations of uh, social isolation, uh, the number of cases was relatively low as compared to this city, Bnei Brak, where the ultra-Orthodox live and Haifa, where Arabs live. So these uh, minority uh, groups did not comply with the uh, Minister of Health recommendations and the number of cases was very high. So the lessons from the first waves in Israel was trust only evidence-based medicine because as you recall, at the beginning, we got the reports on case reports from Europe, many from France, as I recall, uh, suggesting that we need to uh, use azithromycin and uh, hydroxychloroquine, also for medications that were proved to be harmful later on. Second, uh, we learned that uh, ECMOs are really uh, making the difference. And I think that in many centers uh, across the world, people are now using ECMOs uh, in the uh, severe cases of uh, COVID. We, we uh, uh, tend to think that these are severe ARDS that can be saved only with ECMOs. And uh, as my colleague, uh, Dr. Levy pointed out, the, the conclusion of the first waves was that uh, we can trust only on God and on vaccination. And uh, the country gambled and bought many, many vaccines from uh, Moderna and from Pfizer and believe it or not, the government paid for the vaccines at the time of the clinical trial. So even before we got the uh, final reports from the clinical trials, the government already paid for huge number of uh, vaccines from these two companies, mainly Pfizer and also from uh, Moderna. So how did we do it? How did we do it in Israel? Israel, as you can see over here, moves to head of vaccine queue, offering Pfizer access to the country's healthcare database. The uh, Minister of Health has a contract with Pfizer, um, providing them with all sorts of information that they can uh, uh, later on uh, assess the efficacy and safety of the vaccines that are uh, being administered here in Israel. What enabled this uh, widespread of uh, vaccination in our country? First, the uh, health system here is different from many, many countries. All patients, all, all uh, people in Israel belong to one of four HMOs, all of us. We have full coverage 
and the HMOs have all our information on their computers. So uh, all of us have a uh, ID number and the uh, HMO can call you and uh, give you whatever they uh, think is advisable. And in this case was the vaccine in a very short period of time. It was uh, arranged in 400 sites across the country, day and night. The uh, infrastructure was excellent and uh, people were very uh, cooperating at this time with the recommendations of the government. And as you can see over here, the prime minister himself sitting here on a chair was one of the first people to get the uh, vaccine uh, trying to uh, convince the uh, general public to uh, have their vaccine as well. So this is the Israeli health system, the Ministry of Health, and we have the uh, HMOs, four HMOs, and the general hospitals. So each patient belongs to one of the HMOs, and the HMOs are giving the outpatient services to all population in the country, and they provided the vaccines across the country. Another factor that convinced many of the people in our country to uh, have the vaccine at the very beginning was the number of people who died at the end of 2020. And as you can see over here, at the end of the December and January, the toll rate was very, very high. So people actually got scared. And when the government offered them to have the vaccine, many people uh, came in and had the vaccine. The vaccine was uh, not given uh, simultaneously to all uh, population. And we had uh, four tiers, as you can see over here. It started uh, at, towards the end of December uh, with the vaccination of healthcare worker and uh, people who are uh, over the age of 60 severe immunocompromised patients, uh, caregivers to older person, and people with all sorts of chronic uh, diseases. And then later on, they gave to other uh, people who are at uh, risk, diabetes, ob uh, obesity. Um, in uh, late January to uh, younger patients, and now the entire population can get the uh, vaccine as long as you are older at the age of 16 years old. This is, these are some pictures of the, uh, of the uh, uh, units that were developed very rapidly and uh, each person can go in and get the vaccine. And uh, you see the nurses are calling the patients, come in, get the vaccine. Uh, it was very efficient, very rapid process. The uh, data was uh, published uh, uh, this year in several uh, papers. This uh, data was uh, published in the Lancet Oncology. I'm sorry, in the Lancet, not Oncology, in the Lancet, and uh, presents the experience uh, of the Ministry of Health of the administration of these uh, Pfizer uh, vaccines. As you can see, the uh, different age groups that got the vaccine and the uh, number of patients who uh, were vaccinated along uh, the uh, month of January and uh, February, look at the number in one week, in one week, almost uh, 1 million people got vaccinated in Israel. And this, again, it cannot be done in other countries and it can be done only in, in places where you have very efficient health care system. Other data was published at the New England Journal of Medicine and presented the uh, uh, fact, the, the main factor that is uh, presented here is that the number of um, severe cases dropped down dramatically, very rapidly after the administration of the second vaccine. So nowadays we have very low number of uh, sick people and a very low number of uh, patients in the hospitals. This is in Hebrew, but it presents the side effects reported after the first on the right and the second shots of the uh, Pfizer vaccines. These are the reports uh, for the uh, 2 million and 700 uh, first cases who got the first shot, another million and 300,000 cases who got the second shot. 
So the numbers of the uh, most common side effects are presented here. And I guess most of them were not considered to be very uh, serious side effects. I also want to point out that we have one case of a patient uh, who's only, uh, who got a lung transplantation because of the uh, COVID-19. This is a 56-year-old uh, um, gentleman from Northern Israel who was admitted in uh, December uh, and was diagnosed with COVID-19. He was intubated for uh, 45 days, then was put on ECMO and was transferred to uh, our medical center. Overall, he was on the uh, intubated for uh, 86 days, 86 days, 40 of them on ECMO as well. So the only organ uh, that was damaged by the COVID was his lungs. Otherwise he was in a good health condition. And for this reason, we performed lung transplantation in our medical center. This is the only case of this kind in our country. So in summary, COVID-19 put a lot of challenge uh, in, uh, on, on, on Israel in all aspects of life, economy, culture, politics, and medicine, obviously. Uh, as I pointed out, the uh, um, Israel medical community did not have enough resources at, at the very beginning, but in, as a country who is used to uh, cope with disasters, unfortunately, uh, we, we demonstrated our ability to cope with large-scale pandemic uh, using all the uh, um, human resources and everybody was working together. Uh, it is obvious for us that we need to rely on evidence-based medicine and not just administer any medication that you uh, find on the internet. Uh, the importance of ECMO was uh, shown and the... Um, limited number of ICU personnel was uh, a, a great uh, limiting factor, yet there is no Israeli patient who died because of limited uh, number of uh, respirators, ECMOs, or ICU personnel. Finally, we, uh, uh, we re truly uh, thank the uh, Pfizer and Moderna for providing us these vaccines because they truly made uh, made a difference. And uh, we should not forget at this time social distancing, facial masks, and high hygiene that are still uh, used in our country. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahn. That was a great presentation. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to field one of the questions here from the chat box. Um, did you uh, have any problems with vaccine hesitancy among any of the populations? And if so, uh, how was it managed? Oh, hesitancy, you mean that uh, some people are uh, hesitating uh, on uh, having the vaccine. So it's not, uh, if it, it's, it's not mandatory to have the vaccine. I mean, uh, it's, it's uh, done on a voluntary basis. Yet, uh, as you saw, 60% of the population uh, are having the vaccines and it's, it's working beautifully. Uh, in hospitals, all uh, healthcare personnel are advised that they should get the vaccine. However, if they do not want to have the vaccine, they should be tested uh, twice weekly to demonstrate that they are disease free. Okay. Um... The other question here was, uh, did you introduce limits for ICU admission, um, given you know, any limitations you had in ICU beds during um, surges? Yes, but again, we were not uh, in, in a bad shape as, as our colleagues from, from Italy or Spain, uh, for example. And uh, I'm not aware of any case in Israel who did not get an ICU bed when he needed it. So most cases were young and they uh, were not in a bad shape that uh, needed uh, a, a
Oh, I think the connection might be a little slow. Yeah, I think you dropped out for a second. Do you want me to summarize while we're waiting for him to come back on? Uh, let's just give one more second, see if he comes back. Um, okay, yeah, why don't we go to the summary? Um, Dr. Ahn, I'm sorry, you cut off there for a minute. Um, we're gonna proceed with uh, the summary slides. Thank you very much everyone for your talks. Yeah, so we just put together a one slide per speaker just with some of the key takeaways and these will be posted on the site along with the recording of today's session. So thanks everybody for joining. Um, what we saw from our uh, Germany perspective was at the beginning, like many other countries, there were not enough ICU beds. They used a high care, low care system to be able to expand their ICU base uh, such that they ended up having enough beds for everyone. Um, in their first wave, they had a 53% mortality rate uh, with the highest mortality in those over the age of, of 80, 34% who uh, passed away uh, if they were not intubated and 72 when they were intubated. In the second wave, they had a similar mortality of 51% uh, and they had greatly expanded their use of non-invasive ventilation Interestingly, when they have their third wave, uh, which is primarily due to the B117 variant, um, they have 4,700 ICU patients, uh, and it is responsible for 90% of these, and that it is causing more severe disease than the original strain, um, and this is uh, in younger patients as well. They've seen the same comorbidities as other countries, high rates of mortality in those who fail non-invasive ventilation, and that females have a lower mortality rate. Uh, as noted in the chat box, there's a high rate of burnout in their ICU staff with 30% of their ICU nurses looking to leave their jobs in the coming year. And then when we moved on to India, we saw an even more severe uh, lack of ICU beds with only 2.3 per 100,000, one of the lowest in the world, and only 0.8 doctors per 1,000 patients. But with their limited ICU resources and only 48,000 uh, ventilators uh, and inequality and in access to care, they were able to overcome by creating new ICUs, hand making PPEs, and even their own ventilators, uh, and revamping their systems. And through their use of a COVID command center, they were able to manage uh, their patients uh, quite well. They use similar treatments as the rest of the world, uh, and like many of us, avoided non-invasive ventilation up front and then embraced it over time and has had a very good experience with them and had low rates of infections in their staff. And finally, uh, from Israel, uh, eight ICU beds per 100,000, uh, only 2,000 ventilators and 80 ECMOs. But their big difference uh, compared to the rest of us is that 59% of their population has already been vaccinated and they only have 120 patients total on ICU on ventilators at the moment. Um, the government was instrumental in instituting shutdowns, but of course that really did rely on people uh, complying with the shutdowns. <clears throat> And they felt that one of the driving forces of uh, getting people to sign up for vaccines was the high mortality rate uh, in the second wave. So takeaways that uh, are common across uh, other presenters actually is trust only evidence based medicine. So I think a lot of us, you know, really had to rely on that. Uh, ECMO can save patients who otherwise would not uh, make it uh, with just conventional mechanical ventilations. And they were in a unique position to be able to buy vaccines for the whole population and get to jump up the ladder a little bit by barter system, basically by sharing data. So we're all very excited that uh, Israel has done so well on vaccinating. And of course, there are some unanswered questions, but there are at the end of all of these forums as we learn more and more about this deadly disease. And so I'll pass it back to you, Dr. Pedraza. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, I wanted to thank you all uh, again for uh, these great presentations. I, I really think I learned a lot from this uh, and I'm hoping that uh, we were able to share things that uh, others across the world can learn from as well. Um, our next um, webinar is going to be, um, I'm sorry, Lars, at April 26th. I, we actually are taking a break until June because we have the ATS uh, International Conference uh, coming up next month. Yeah. Okay. 
All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, thank yous to, to Dr. Kia Giannidis, Dr. Chaco, and Dr. Ahn for putting together such great presentations. Thank you so much. <laughs> really appreciate you sharing your experiences.